Well, good morning uh, and welcome. Um, my name is Tom Leonard. I'm president of the Technology Policy Institute. And welcome to our session this morning um, on the FCC's recent proposal um, for new privacy uh, requirements for internet service providers. I suspect, as most of the people in this room know, uh, the principal privacy uh, enforcement agency in the United States is the Federal Trade Commission, Commission with authority to uh, to police unfair and deceptive uh, acts and practices. And the FTC has general jurisdiction uh, over the economy, um, over most sections of the economy, which up until recently included the I ISPs. The FTC does not, however, have jurisdiction over common carrier services. So the FCC's recent net neutrality rule, which reclassified uh, broadband internet access service as a common carrier service took away the FTC's jurisdiction uh, over the sector, and the FCC has chosen to fill this gap with the proposal that it, uh, that it released on April 1st. Uh, that proposal, as, as, as you know, has been the subject of much commentary and raises uh, a number of questions, the central question being, as with any other regulation, uh, is it good for consumers? So we have an, a really good panel to discuss this issue today. Um, I will briefly introduce them, and, and uh, they will give uh, some opening remarks, and then we'll get into a broader discussion, and we'll allow plenty of time for, uh, for audience participation. Um, our first speaker is going to be Lisa Hone, who is, the, and I won't go through the detailed bios, but just because you have them. Our first pe speaker is going to be uh, Lisa Hone, who's the Associate Bureau Chief responsible for privacy issues in the Wireline Competition Bureau at the FCC. Um, a number of, uh, we have, we have a, a cross-section of people here with, with expertise in FTC matters and, and FCC and telecommunications matters. So Lisa's at the FCC, but she spent a decade at the FTC. Um, Jim Halpert is the uh, global co-chair of DLA Piper's Data Protection, Privacy, and Security, and Cybersecurity Practice, and is a very well-known uh, privacy lawyer in town. John Neuchterlin is, uh, is the partner and co-chair of Sidley Austin's Communications Regulatory Practice, uh, and he recently came off a stint of a couple of years as, as, as general counsel of the FTC. And Josh Wright is a, a professor of law at George Mason Law School. He's the director of the Global Antitrust Institute uh, and holds a courtesy appointment in the Department of Economics at George Mason. And he was recently a commissioner at the, uh, at the FTC. So we're going to start with Lisa, um, who will uh, explain the rule. Uh, and then uh, we're going to go through the rest of the panel in alphabetical order. Lisa? Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, nice to see so many familiar faces. So as always, I feel compelled to say that uh, the views I express today are not the views of any of the commissioner of any particular commissioner. I really see my role here as uh, being a guide through the NPRM uh, and a cheerleader to encourage all of you to file substantive uh, productive comments in this rulemaking, and I see a lot of people out there that I fully expect to file substantive um, and uh, helpful comments. Um, so let me just, by a show of hands, see how many of you have read the NPRM. Yeah, so almost everybody. So I don't really need to give an introduction, <laughs> but, but I will anyway just for level setting. Um, and I will try and keep it brief in light of the fact that most of you have read the NPRM or feel compelled among your peers to say that you have. <laughs> um, but, but I actually believe most of you have. Um, the, the NPRM, as you all know, uh, is focused on um, proposed rules uh, pursuant to Section 222 of the Communications Act. Um, and it proposes to uh, protect consumers' privacy, and the particular consumers at issue are customers of broadband internet access services. Um, in th from the um, open internet proceeding, uh, we take and use the lovely term bias services. Uh, the NPRM starts by proposing by definitions, which makes sense because I know most of you are all lawyers and you understand the importance of definitions. And then it proposes a framework for protecting customers' privacy 
focused on three pillars of privacy um, that the FCC did not create. These are really, uh, uh, the, instead what the commission did was embrace the fair information practices principles and look at all of the good work done by all of the privacy agencies out there, including the Federal Trade Commission, as well as those agencies, other agencies that do sector specific regulation. Um, and uh, the item focuses on three pillars of privacy, transparency or disclosure, choice or consent, and uh, security. And we include, and the item includes within security both uh, data security and data breach notification. So on transparency, the item proposes that customers should have, uh, should be provided information about what information their ISP collects and how it uses it and be given the op opportunity, and how, they, how consumers can exercise choice. Um, I think it's fair to say the choice component of the proposal is, is the most controversial. It proposes generally that customers' information is their own and they should be able to control use of their information by their broadband provider. It looks to the FTC's proposed privacy framework um, and identifies uh, consumer expectation as the defining uh, principle for how customer information should be treated. Uh, there is some information the proposal suggests that customers have agreed to allow their broadband providers to use or instances in which they've allowed them to use their information uh, by signing up for the service. So when you sign up for an ISP, you're obviously consenting to have the ISP use your information uh, to take you to the internet and bring internet traffic back to you. Um, there are also some other uh, expectations within, the, within Section 222 itself um, and some other uh, proposed expectations that uh, the item suggests are inherent in the broadband provider customer relationship. The second uh, sort of tier of choice is opt out consent. So that is that the broadband provider would be able to use their customer's information, set, but allow customers to choose to opt out of such uses of that information. And the types of uses that the proposal suggests treating as subject to opt out consent. Uh, I, are marketing purposes and specifically marketing for uh, communications related services by the ISP or by an affiliate of the ISP that provides communications related services. Um, so you would see this in a tri typical tri triple play scenario. I purchase broadband services from an ISP. They want to uh, wireline broadband services from an ISP. They want to market uh, wireless ISP services to me or voice services to me. And they could use my customer information, my information as a customer of the broadband provider to market those services to me subject to opt out consent is what the proposal recommends. And third is, uh, excuse me, opt in and the, uh, everything else would fall under opt-in. Um, so I expect vigorous comment around this. Uh, I look forward to it. I would encourage everybody to talk about both the underpinnings of their arguments and also operational issues um, because this is not new territory. All ISPs grapple with these issues already. Most ISPs and certainly all of the major uh, national ISPs have chief privacy officers and staffs which grapple with issues um, of transparency, consent, and uh, security every day. And so I think from the staff perspective, we're really interested in hearing what works, what doesn't work for customers and for ISPs. And then third is data security. And again, we look very closely to the, what uh, the FTC has done in terms of expecting providers, all, all companies, to provide reasonable data security practices um, and data breach notification. Um, and, uh, sorry, so the FTC part is a data security. Data breach notification, the FTC does not have data breach notification uh, authority, broad authority, and has not exercised its unjust, its deceptive run fair practices authority to require data breach notification. Instead, they've gone to the Congress and asked for data breach authority. But our current rules, which govern primarily voice services, do include data breach notification, and we propose to um, harmonize our voice rules with our uh, broadband rules and update them. Uh, so the, that in every other instance we seek comment, the Commission seeks comment on harmonization of our voice rules with the proposed broadband rules. With respect to data breach, the pro it specifically proposes harmonizing those rules. 
Um, the item also sees comment on a variety of other issues, including other issues relating to the fair information practice principles. It seeks comment on whether there should be a right to access and correct information. It seeks comment on complaint uh, resolution. It also seeks comment on whether there are any practices that should be prohibited. Um, one of the ones that has gotten the most attention, of course, is sometimes called pay for privacy. We don't use that term in the item. Um, but the concept of should consumers be able to, uh, to, to receive a benefit for giving up their privacy. Um, and then it sees comment on a wide range of proposals that we got from stakeholders before the NPRM, including proposals from the industry from various public and from various public interest groups, as well as seeking comment on what, if any, role there should be, could be for uh, industry self-regulation and um, and that's the item. So uh, if, it's wi if my description is wildly different than what you all read, I'd like to hear about it. <laughs> um, otherwise, I look forward to your questions and ultimately to your comments and your ex partes in the proceeding. Thanks, Lisa. Jim? Uh, thanks, Lisa. I, I'd like to pick up from that high level description of the order and place it NPRM. in the NPRM, the, NPRM. <laughs> the proposed order, excuse me, <laughs> and place it in the context of overall privacy, information security, and cybersecurity uh, requirements and good practices in the United States. And I think the way that I read the, the NPRM's proposal, it actually largely tries to fit uh, certain information that broadband internet access providers obtain in as to the extent possible into the CPNI framework with some updating but basically fitting into the the three tier opt in broad opt in narrow opt out for certain practices and then certain practices are considered to be um, uh, expected by consumers by nature of the service on the data security and the breach notice side I'll just describe how this really is wildly different than the way that that law works in those areas. And I also, I'd also add, just with regard to privacy as well, that there's an odd sort of shoehorning of what would be CPNI if one were to, to uh, try to find, translate the definition of CPNI into the broadband context, that winds up focusing on information that really is not very sensitive or not sensitive at all. And the order winds up kind of bizarre, proposed NPRM. order. <laughs> <laughs> winds up bizarrely regulating, not regulating content, it proposes questions about having greater requirements for content, and not really addressing deep packet inspection. Again, that's left as a, an additional possible topic for comment. I'd submit that those were the issues, the privacy issues that were of concern with regard to ISPs five years ago, and that this exercise of trying to figure out what would be the equivalent of CPNI on the broadband side winds up putting the cart before the horse and really focusing on things that don't matter very much to consumers in a way that I think would, would wind up being confusing and creating some other problems. So I'll describe that. Um, th there's a sort of color by numbers quality to saying, well, for example, uh, directory information would is exempt from the CPNI rule, but we are going to decide nonetheless to include that information in what we're going to regulate under CI. Um, and we're going to focus really heavily on things like IP addresses and MAC addresses that might be link linked or linkable to an individual, even though that information is publicly available essentially on the internet. Anywhere a user goes um, to any website, the IP address is collected along with the browser type, a bunch of other information that is CPNI. That is the equivalent statutorily of directory information. But I think there may be a little bit of um, sort of heads you win, tails, uh, or heads I win, tails you lose sort of approach because there's an exemption for directory information that doesn't apply in this proposed order. And at the same time, the order hones in and places tons of requirements on information that is linkable to an individual or to IP addresses. So um, the approach of the FCC CPNI order is to categorically regulate all information that fits within the definition of, C of CPNI and subject it to some requirements that are really very unusual. 
The original reason for this uh, was that in the middle of the last decade, there was a pattern of private investigators doing pretext calling and obtaining phone records from individuals. The FCC then, I think, overreacted a little bit and imposed regulatory requirements, things like audit logs, fast breach, super fast breach notice requirements for um, this uh, universe of CPNI. The NPRM comes through and would propose the that essentially pretty close to the existing CPNI requirements apply to a much much broader range of information. It now wants to regulate um, customer information, which is defined again as any information that's linked or linkable to an individual. It includes sensitive information that we should be really concerned about, like social security numbers or driver's license numbers. But then it includes you know, any, anything virtually that's in the customer's account. And that information is not sensitive, and I don't think it makes sense as a matter of information security policy to impose a lot of requirements on that. Um, so rather than focusing on, on security, th security instances that could give rise to harm to consumers, it's just coloring by numbers and saying, okay, this is like CPNI, and that's the way we did CPNI and CPNI security in the past, and so we're going to do that here. Um, the, uh, and with regard to directory information, again, the directory information doesn't apply in the CPNI context, but one might also ask more seriously, is there a pattern of people engaging in pretext calling and obtaining IS information from ISPs about their subscribers? I don't see that anywhere in the NPRM, and I think that's the underlying logic of all these CPNI privacy rules. Similarly, as I mentioned briefly before, the IP address and MAC address are collected all over the internet. Uh, similarly, the customer name and, and address information is typically available publicly. And to impose heavy-duty security requirements on those sorts of elements um, is really a, a misallocation of security resources, particularly when you consider that broadband ISPs have all been classified as critical infrastructure providers. Now, do we want them spending millions of dollars and focusing heavy-duty security requirements on information that's freely available, essentially, in the public, that's actually offered for sale uh, by data brokers all over um, the, the Internet and, and, and in other parts of the economy? I really don't think so, and I think that's, again, the, the problem of this, this trying to shoehorn um, the broadband uh, provider data into the, the general security framework of the, of the uh, original CPNI order. Second, if you look at the proposed information security and breach notice requirements, they're really totally unprecedented outside of the CPNI context and go far, far beyond anything in state law or, or at the FTC. So state data security requirements are reserved for information that creates a risk of identity theft or fraud against individuals or to personal medical data. I submit that there really is no similarity between the websites that I may have visited and all my health problems. And I don't think that the order quite gets this, this right. Um, the, um, no state requires securing information that's simply linked or linkable to an individual because it would be a huge waste of resources to do this. Um, and um, the risk management practices, including uh, having audit logs that apply to every contractor or employee who may access MAC address or IP address data, is utterly foreign to information security law anywhere. And, and, and this is, again, an area of, of I think counterproductive uh, overregulation. Um, the, also, the uh, the logs are supposed to be kept for one year. Um, logging, network logging, is a very good practice, but specifically targeting special logging for information that creates no risk to consumers is not a good practice and is probably a waste of resources from a security perspective. Similarly, on the breach notice requirement, no state requires notification for this range of information. States reserve notification requirements for breaches of risky data elements, like name plus social security number, driver's license number, financial account number, uh, biometric data, series of different uh, data elements. I could certainly see the, and the ultimate order requiring notice for those data elements. It's not really necessary because state law requires it already, but I could see doing that. But requiring notice uh, for breaches of the MAC address or IP address really 
is again is is very odd. Uh, bear in mind that the average cost of a breach notice incident is, if you look at just out of pocket costs, is sixty to sixty five dollars per record. That doesn't include loss of goodwill associated with data breaches. This is imposing some pretty heavy costs and I think misaligning security incentives uh, with regard to protecting information. What's more, the NPRM's proposed definition of a data breach goes far, far beyond any state law. Every state, unlike every state law, the FCC proposal would require notification in all cases to the FCC within seven days and to individuals within 10 days. Now the shortest state breach notice deadline is 30 days, this is Florida's, with an automatic 15-day extension. Uh, this is because complex breaches take well over a month to uh, figure out in order to decide whom to notify. Hackers are very, very subtle, and finding malware and discovering the extent of an incident uh, can be uh, very, very challenging. A seven to 10 day notice deadline with the prospect of very substantial fines, because that's been the way that the FCC has been doing enforcement in this area, with enforcement in the tens of millions of dollars, will misalign incentives in responding to data breaches that really could create risk for consumers. Um, and uh, furthermore, treating any incident of accidental, honest, good faith access to CPNI that exceeds authorized access rules, so an, someone's allowed to get into the database but is not supposed to go look at this particular information, again, is, is aligning incentives on security in, in ways that really don't make very much sense. It does make sense in the logic of the CPNI order previously because it required audit logs, but it is not a good security practice. Uh, furthermore, that notice is required even if data is encrypted and even if the employer or contractor had the right to access the system but did so in a way that, that exceeded permissions and company policy. But more fundamentally, there's no risk of harm here. And there's an a, uh, as, a tr as a requirement for notice to be required. Um, furthermore, there's an access requirement. Only three states have access as the trigger for notice, and they all have harm triggers that both go out the window here. So we're in a world of detailed accountings to the FCC about times that somebody got into a CPNI database um, with you know, special expenditures of money to have the audit logging to do this. But um, anytime you know, garden variety name or address information is accessed, even though it's publicly available on the internet, the broadband ISP is supposed to contact the FCC and possibly the Secret Service and, and uh, FBI when there are more than 5,000 um, uh, customers' information that's, uh, that's affected here. This sort of garden variety information should not be the subject of breach notice requirements. And it really, I think, calls into question whether the whole CPNI architecture really makes sense in this context as opposed to activities that I described like, ex uh, like uh, contents of, of communications being breached or uh, deep packet inspection occurring on the privacy side. These are things that really matter to consumers and really matter as a matter of privacy and the overall framework of privacy and in information security law. Um, and given that these are operators of critical infrastructure, putting them these obligations and risks on them for information that creates no risk whatsoever is really a distraction from much more important security responsibilities. Um, it, it gets to the level of being really bad cybersecurity policy because we want these operators to be protecting their networks rather than worrying about every piece of information that might be linkable to an individual customer. I'll also spend just one minute about the, um, the advertising opt-in requirement, which, which Lisa described, and how that differs also from the privacy framework. Under the 2012 FTC Privacy Staff Report, which is referenced multiple times in the NPRM, uh, businesses may use co consumer data for many marketing and advertising purposes based on implied or opt-out consent. Opt-in consent is required only for use or disclosure of particularly sensitive data or for purposes that really differ drastically from the purposes for which uh, information was collected in the first place unless there's clear notice to consumers warning the consumer of that. Here, all that goes out the window, it's opt-in in all circumstances, even when there's clear notice to consumers when they're signing up for service or uh, you know, no, a notice that's unavoidable and floated to consumers. That's very, very different. 
Similarly, under ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Statute, there's no restriction at all on internal uses by ISPs of customer information, nor is there a restriction on video rental companies who can know all the weird movies that people watched of, of advertising to those individuals under the Video Privacy Protection Act. Financial services firms can use sensitive financial data for advertising. And even if we look at the really stringent um, EU pr uh, general uh, privacy regulation, which is designed to be a, a model of stringent privacy regulation for the rest of the world, internal uses of information to advertise to existing customers do not uh, require even notice or uh, uh, require notice, but not opt in or opt out consent. Um, finally, the um, granular sort of notice that would be required under the NPRM of how the bias provider uses under, and under what circumstances it discloses each type of customer PII that it collects would be a major departure from the short form notice practices that the FTC privacy staff report encourages and um, that's uh, very, very much what consumers can understand. The net result is probably going to be consumers being pretty confused by these notices, having choice only with respect to a certain type of collection of information, not understanding the difference of that between other forms of collection that may occur on the internet, and then having um, opt-in consent uh, apply for, for example, ISPs offering their, their customers um, additional over-the-top content at a bundle at a discounted price with their bundle or offering uh, alarm monitoring services. Again, these are not the sort of things that typically would require opt-in consent or trigger heavy security requirements. So anyway, that's, that's just an example of how this order, I think, builds on a framework that is very, very particular with regard to CP&I, but really doesn't make sense for the internet. Thanks, Jim. Lisa, if you want, I don't know if you want to wait until after for everybody has spoken to comment or... Well, it, well let me just offer yeah, two sure. broad thoughts. One, it is a notice of proposed rulemaking, so notwithstanding the fact that Jim is convinced <laughs> it's an order and <laughs> closed Sorry. with that, it is not. And I look forward, again, to everybody's comments. I, you know, Jim makes a lot of representations about what consumers want. I didn't hear any basis for those representations, um, and it's I one of the questions any, I think. I, did, I didn't assert that consumers want anything. I'm just talking about how this is different than no, the privacy No, at least three times you, ex you, you, you told the room what customer expectations, what consumer expectations are. I'm not, I think that is an open question. Certainly surveys suggest consumers want more privacy choices. But I also, on data breach specifically, want to be very clear, and I think you missed a key part of the NPRM, the NPRM proposes to have data breach notification triggers and seeks comment on what those triggers should be. So it specifically says that we're not sure that economic harm should be the only trigger, but we invite robust comment on what those triggers should be and proposes to have triggers recognizing the problem of over notification and the challenges of, of, um, of misallocation of resources. So I strongly encourage everybody to look at that question of data breach triggers and to comment on what you think the right trigger should be. Thanks. John? Uh, good morning. Uh, I am John Nectarline. I want to start with a uh, disclosure and a disclaimer. Uh, the disclosure is that I have clients in this area. Um, they are uh, what we in the industry call ISPs, not bias providers. <laughs> um, um, Might that the, term indicate some bias? <laughs> <the> question, <but. laughs> and the uh, disclaimer is simply that I'm not here speaking for those clients. I'm speaking only for myself. Um, I also want to begin with a shout out to Lisa for being here, um, although I don't really need to shout because she's sitting right here. But Lisa um, came into this forum knowing that she would be subject to a lot of rather close scrutiny of the proposal, and uh, this is not in every respect the most hospitable forum for her to be defending it, and I just think it's, it's an example of good government that she's here. Um, so why are we here? We're here because the uh, F FCC has reclassified broadband internet access service as a Title II service unless that or some portion of it gets overturned on appeal. The result is that the FTC lacks uh, what it has had for a long time, which is uh, privacy and data security jurisdiction over uh, broadband ISPs. Um, and I'll also start with a point of consensus, which is I think 
most people agree that there's a value to having a governmental cop on, on the beat. The, the question is whether those cops should be enforcing different laws for different competitors in the same ecosystem. Um, and the NPRM addresses that issue in passing on, in paragraph 132. Um, it says, quote, we recognize that edge providers are not subject to the same regulatory framework and that this regulatory disparity could have competitive ripple effects. Um, the first reason, the, and the FCC says, well, not to worry, uh, we have three reasons why, why we think th this regulatory disparity uh, will be attenuated. The first is, as it points out, that edge providers are subject to the FTC's privacy regime. But of course, the difference is that the FTC's privacy regulation is more flexible and much less prescriptive than the FCC's. And more importantly, the FTC's um, initiatives under Section 5 of the FTC Act are uh, confined to uh, its deception authority in which it polices breaches of promises, uh, either explicit or implicit and its unfairness authority, where by statute it is required under Section 5N of the FTC Act to conduct what could loosely be called a cost-benefit analysis. Um, the, the FTC's emphasis on conducting cost-benefit analysis um, is absent from the NPRM. There, there are nods to it, but it is claim, plainly not the focus of the FCC's initiative. Uh, number two is a reason why the FCC says not to worry about these regulatory disparities. Edge providers, they say, are, quote, increasingly op adopting opt-in regimes for sharing of some types of sensitive information. Well, that's laudable, and it's a great idea to be doing that, and everyone should really be doing that. But the problem with the FCC's proposal is that it doesn't stop there. I mean, unlike the existing privacy regime that we have, which is calibrated to differences in the sensitivity of consumer information, the FCC um, would essentially preclude the use of all uh, consumer information for, uh, uh, for non-communication services by ISPs. So there's no real distinction between sensitive versus non-sensitive information. There is this distinction between communications-related services and non-communications-related services. If you're an ISP and you want to use information for communications-related services, that is a flexible opt-out regime. If, however, you want to use it for this amorphous category, amorphous and quite huge category of non-communications-related services, then you're subject to an inflexible opt-in requirement irrespective of how sensitive the data at issue is. Um, that distinction between communications-related services and non-communications-related services might have been fairly based in consumer expectations in the telephone world of the mid-1990s, but we now live in um, a fairly interconnected internet ecosystem where consumers do not distinguish as sharply among the different types of services that they can use. Um, third, the FCC says, don't worry about the, um, com the regulatory and competitive disparity in our rules, and this is really the nub of the item, um, because, quote, edge providers only have direct, be because there's more of a need, according to the FCC, quote, edge providers only have direct access to the information that customers choose to share with them by virtue of engaging their services. In contrast, broadband providers have direct access to potentially all customer information, unquote. So both halves of that sentence are problematic. Um, as an initial matter, outside specialized context, most consumers never in any meaningful sense choose to share information with edge providers such as their Android operating system or their mobile apps. But they routinely, but those, those providers, those edge providers routinely collect uh, enormous volumes of information, some of which could be deemed sensitive about consumers. Um, and that information, uh, subject to sector-specific regulation, such as HIPAA or um, uh, Grand Leach, Bliley, um, are bought and sold regularly by data brokers. Uh, the, the internet ecosystem knows a great deal about all of us. The reason is that, for the most part, edge providers um, are not subject to uh, uh, sort of inflexible privacy rules that the FCC proposes here. And by the way, I just want to be clear, there's nothing wrong with edge providers doing this. This is a source of great value creation in the modern economy. There's a reason why Google has the largest market cap of any company. It's because uh, knowing data about consumers um, is 
a source of great efficiency and value creation in the modern economy. So this is, there's no, I'm not trying to disparage anything that the edge providers do. I'm just wondering why the edge providers, uh, what, why we would want to live in a world where one sector of the interconnected internet ecosystem is subject to much more rigorous regulation than all other sectors. Um, the other half of the FCC's empirical proposition about um, ISP omniscience vis-a-vis -vis edge providers is also flawed. Um, as many people in the room know, Peter Swire just uh, issued a white paper in which he explained the technology underlying what edge providers see and compared it to what ISPs see. Um, ISPs, it turns out, are, are far less omniscient than many people believe, um, in part for, for a variety of different reasons. One is, in the wake of the Edward Snowden revelations, uh, it has become increasingly and rapidly popular for the leading websites to encrypt the data flowing between their customers and themselves. So this is the use of the HTTPS protocol versus the HTTP protocol. So I mean, consider what happens when you type a Google search. I'll say that I want to type a Google search to find out about hospitals in my area that have um, highly regarded oncology practices. When I type that Google search, uh, Google has visibility into my request for information about oncology practices and can make any variety of inferences about that. My ISP has no idea what I'm asking Google to, um, to tell me because that data exchange is encrypted by default by Google. It's, it uses the HTTPS protocol. Now, the ISP may, may or may not later see what sorts of websites I go to, but it may, it may be able to draw no real inferences about those websites because I may, just go to a, I may just go to the website of a hospital, and that website itself may uh, probably is encrypted, and the uh, ISP will not be able to have visibility into what it is exactly um, it, I, I'm trying to obtain uh, in the way of medical services. In addition, um, in, it used to be the case in the 90s that we all sat at home and had one broadband connection, maybe we went into work, we had another broadband connection there, maybe we had two different ISPs serving us. Um, in today's world, as I walk from my home to my car to uh, my workplace to Starbucks, I'm using three, four, five different ISPs. Each of those times, though, I'm logged into Google and Facebook Google and Facebook have comprehensive visibility into my activities. Um, each of those ISPs has limited uh, visibility into those activities, uh, not just, again, not just because I'm hopping from ISP to ISP, but also because the Google and Facebook activities that I engage in, which are probably more sensitive than most of the other activities that I engage in online, they are all encrypted by default. So the ISP doesn't get to see, none, none of these four ISPs gets to see what it is I'm doing there. Um, and finally, the FCC says, okay, well, maybe there's a um, competitive reason why we should distinguish between ISPs and non-ISPs. Um, it's, there isn't, it, it isn't easy enough for consumers to switch from one ISP to another, whereas it's, it's quite easy for consumers to switch from one edge provider to another. That's, um, that is not an empirically grounded proposition. Um, it is much easier for me to switch, for, well, it is much easier for me to switch from one mobile provider to another. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a joke that I decided not to tell. <laughs> I, I, it's much easier for me to switch from one mobile provider to another than it is for me to switch from Facebook to some other internet social media platform where all my friends are. And the reason is um, Facebook benefits from enormous network effects, whereas the mobile ecosystem is actually fairly um, competitive and by virtue of the FCC's number portability initiative, it is, um, the switching costs are not that high. That's why we see commercials on TV all the time encouraging us to switch from one mobile provider to another. We don't see those commercials <laughs> are encouraging people to switch from Facebook to the alternative to Facebook because it's just harder to make that switch. So there's not a strong empirical basis for the claim that there's something really special about the competitive or switching cost status of ISPs. Um, if I, I just want to say a couple words about um, why any of this matters. I and mean, we have asymmetric regulation throughout the economy um, in all sorts of contexts. Sometimes we care about it, sometimes we don't care about it. What are the costs of asymmetric regulation here? 
Um, well, the first set of costs is what Jim referred to. The, I mean, there, there are, um, for every data breach, um, there are enormous costs in, involved in reaching out to consumers. There are also, in terms of like calibrating different provider systems to account for all these different rules, there are going to be enormous systems costs. Um, all these costs are cognizable under the Paperwork Reduction Act, by the way, and that means that OMB will probably be playing a significant role in reviewing these rules, but they're also costs that ultimately get passed through, to some extent, to consumers. I mean, they're a, a cost, a regulatory cost, that um, <clears throat> to some extent w consumers will see in the form of higher bills. So that's one set of costs. Sometimes costs like that are worth imposing. Sometimes they're not, and so the question is whether these are. Um, this, a second type of cost is another source of upper pressure in broadband pr prices. Um, think about the business model of ISPs in the emerging big data ecosystem as a double-sided market, not unlike what you find with newspapers or magazines. Of course, they rely most, mostly on subscription fees in order to provide service and recover their costs, but to the extent that they can earn additional revenues, um, from the constructive use of data that, and, and those revenues are unrelated to subscription prices, uh, but are the result of signing somebody up, um, they help defray the cost of investment. And no matter how competitive you think this marketplace is under standard economic theory, Josh will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the, in, in a double-sided market, if you impose artificial constraints on the ability to recover revenues you know, on one side of the market, it's going to lead the profit maximizing price on the other side of the market to increase. Um, a couple other potential harms. One is uh, decreased innovation because of the uncertainty of what is covered by opt-in uh, versus opt-out. I think uh, over a long period, if these rules are adopted, ISPs will have a hard time figuring out what counts as a communications-related service. Is an over-the-top video app on my smartphone a communications-related service? What about a social media app like YouTube or something with a heavy video streaming component? At what point do you draw the line? And are we giving providers artificial perverse incentives not to innovate because they don't want to have to face the burdensome costs of opt-in? Um, and finally, as, as Jim points out, there's, the, there's a concern about con consumer confusion. Um, consumers, you can look at any number of surveys. It turns out that consumers, by and large, have only a vague notion of how their data is being used today by edge providers and many others. Um, cons it, the consumers cannot readily, readily, many consumers, some are more savvy than others, many consumers cannot readily distinguish among the interrelated participants in the internet ecosystem. They don't have a clear sense of the distinction between the Android operating system and the smartphone provider and the um, Wi-Fi provider in Starbucks versus their home ISP. And they're not necessarily going to understand that the FCC rules here are narrowly targeted to a very specific set of competitors in the center-related um, ecosystem. And so there is a concern that these rules will lead consumers to a false sense of assurance about steps that are being taken to protect their privacy. On the other hand, the same rules for similar reasons could lead to a ratcheting up of privacy rules for other participants in the internet ecosystem to the extent that policymakers are concerned about competitive asymmetries here. I would not be surprised to see renewed discussion about whether there ought to be heavier prescriptive regulation of data practices elsewhere in the internet ecosystem. If you think, as I do, that data practices right now are um, reasonably well governed uh, and are sources of enormous consumer value, that too is a disquieting possibility. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Josh? Sure. So, I left the FTC, so I'm not supposed to have to do a disclaimer, but you don't, you don't have to do this. John's was good, so hold whatever I say just against me and not other people, um, unless you really want to. Uh, so I think why I'm, I'm, I'm here and what my comparative advantage is, uh, I think, uh, on the panel, though John nailed the economic theory part, uh, is as an economist and a FTC person, and with both of those, hats on. I, I read the NPRM and with, with uh, great interest, and so I'll spend most of my time talking about um, 
what I think is missing from the discussion of the FTC's approach to privacy in the MPRM and sort of maybe generally. Uh, I said, I think, I, I got in a little bit of trouble for this when I was commissioner. It was frowned upon uh, by some of my colleagues. But in Congress, I said something along the lines of the open, ed open internet order being the equivalent of taking the FTC's jurisdictional lunch money. Um, and I thought that the agency should be a little bit more vigorous ex ante and going screaming and kicking into the night um, and was a little bit disappointed uh, that we did not. So I was trying to think about if the open ended internet order was getting our, our lunch money taken, what, what this is. I think this is bringing our lunch the next day and having it taken too, um, but having the FCC be really nice about it. We're, fi we're cited 50 times. They compliment us, us on the sandwich we made. Um, <laughs> <laughs> while they ate it, um, but, but they still ate it. So let me talk a little bit about why that is. We're cited 50 or so times, and it's largely through mapping the FTC's privacy approach onto stuff in the 2012 privacy report. Fair enough, it's our privacy report. Um, things like consumer choice and transparency and privacy design by design and, and, and the like. A very important part about FTC consumer protection enforcement generally, but privacy in particular, is that those concepts are read through the prism of economic analysis required uh, in the deception authority, misrepresentation or omission to consumer, a consumer's detriment, um, and through the unfairness standard, which uh, John already uh, spoke about, but requires a cost-benefit analysis. Both the unfairness uh, authority and uh, the deception authority at the FTC and the privacy actions that we have taken, and we've been quite active uh, in that regard. See, I left, and I still say we. I'll, I'm going to stop that. Um, It'll take five years. And if, and, <laughs> and it, it hasn't taken me that long. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get notes from you later. Um, and in case I screw up, every time I say something other than NPRM, I, I mean NPRM. So Thank you. The, the item. The, the, the item. So when the FTC uh, brings privacy enforcement actions, either through deception or unfairness, those standards underlying the FTC's enforcement uh, and policy practice in the area require economic analysis. There are 50-something, uh, low 50s, uh, industrial organization economists, PhD economists inside the FTC's Bureau of Economics who, um, by my measure, are probably the best collection of professional economists in any government regulatory agency in the country. Um, importantly, they work on all the consumer protection cases. Now, sometimes your job is easy. It's plain, simple fraud. You don't need a PhD in economics to say, hey, that's bad. So they write a really short memo that says, hey, that's bad. Uh, but in really tough uh, cases in particular, the economists are engaged to help walk us through um, what the right analysis is. In an unfairness case, is the cost-benefit test satisfied? Uh, in a deception case, where's the harm? Sometimes how big is the harm? We may want to know for uh, sort of other reasons. Point being, um, those concepts, privacy by design, uh, which does this mean privacy design at any, by, at any cost? Does it mean if the costs of incorporating privacy by design are less than the benefits, we should do it anyway? FTC's economic approach has a fairly straightforward answer uh, to that question. But the important part is that economic uh, and empirical approach is in the DNA of the FTC's uh, privacy approach. I'm an economist. Sometimes I criticize the agency for saying we should do, we should hand over, you know, sort of more of the reins to the economists what I think, and I got outvoted sometimes on, on those proposals. But the complaint is never that the approach is uh, non-economic altogether. That brings me to the NPRM, which I think is non-economic altogether. Uh, and I think that is really the core problem, and we can sort of translate that into the gap between the legal authorities, the gap in between the unfairness statement, unfairness authority of the FTC as applied versus what's in the NPRM, or the deception authority as applied and what's in the NPR, NPRM. The root cause of this, I think, is that so far as I can tell, the NPRM adopts what I think is a fairly sort of non-economic approach uh, to these 
to these same issues. Now, we can, I, the example that jumps to mind, um, you know, if you think about the core of the FTC's approach, it's about matching preferences uh, to, to products and offerings and understanding that consumers have highly heterogeneous preferences. They care sometimes, they don't care other times. The prices that they may accept to engage in one behavior is really high in some context and really different in other contexts, and maybe it's low on Thursdays. The way that we address this in an economic approach is we, we go and get the data. And while I have a microphone, by data, I don't just mean surveys. Um, I mean, revealed preference. I mean, what consumers do. There are economists who study uh, these questions with, with serious rigor. Um, I think when uh, and this is an area where the questions are hard and measurement is hard. So um, these are all difficult questions, to be sure, to address from an economic approach. But there's work that's been done, and not much of it's cited in the report, uh, in the NPRM. Um, and I think when the FT, I have the same criticism at the FTC, when we point to surveys that say, you know, X percent of people uh, love privacy or don't love privacy or really super duper love privacy, the survey doesn't say compared to what and when and how much are they willing to pay for it. The one place where I think um, this sort of comes uh, is the most obvious in the NPRM is the discussion of the, the ban uh, on the proposed uh, ban in MPM on uh, pay for privacy related practices or offering discounts in exchange for uh, giving up some, um, some, some privacy rights. Well, that to me, I think if you were to line up 100 industrial organization economists and say you've got a voluntary transaction um, between two people, it seems to be widely adopted in the market, uh, did consumer welfare go up or down? About 100% of them would start with the answer, probably up. About 100% of them would be open to a rebuttable showing and say, well, you know, markets fail sometimes. Funny things happen sometimes. There are practices that are widely adopted, uh, but for some reason aren't increasing welfare uh, for this reason or another. And the burden would be upon uh, the party making that argument to, to demonstrate that, hey, you got a voluntary transaction here that's really widely adopted and people seem to like. And, and it involves a discount. Um, but something's gone awry here. And we would investigate, and we'd get data, and we would sort of wor work through it. I mean, the idea of uh, a ban, I think that, that practice in particular, I think if you were to line up industrial organization practices and say, what's your bet? Raise consumer welfare or make them worse off. I think the overwhelming of money would be on make them worse off. But the real problem to me is not whether I think the economists agree with the rule or not. It's the, the method by which the proposal discusses it. It is, um, well, you said earlier, where's your data? So it's the same question. Where, where, where's your data um, for the proposition that this sort of practice on average, on net, sometimes reduces welfare and that the NPRM is targeted at um, the instances in which it, 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 it does reduce welfare. Instead, what we get is, well, it's a really popular practice. Normally, we think that that's making people better off, but maybe not, because maybe. Um, and the explanation is something that would swallow essentially all of economics. Uh, maybe voluntary, tr voluntary transactions don't work because one side of the transaction doesn't know what they're doing. It says it in better language than that, but that's essentially what uh, the explanation is. If that's true, I want somebody to show me. There are instances in economics and in markets where that is true, where the markets fail and we, we do something about it. Uh, the context, I think, is there's, um, there's not a method behind the madness in terms of certainly not an economic method behind the madness of determining when or whether or, 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 or uh, we should do, do any of this. I'll, I'll sort of leave that as my, my only example. There are others, but I think that's the one that highlights the conceptual point of what, when I look at um, comparing the approach in the NPRM versus comparing uh, how privacy is both thought about uh, and implemented at the FTC, th that example, I think, really highlights, uh, to me, uh, the greatest disparity in terms of, uh, best I can tell, uh, the lack of an economic approach in, in the NPRM. Let me close with two quick things about um, implications. So 
one thing I, I, I think is worth noting and get sort of with my um, FTC hat on a little bit here is this does put the FTC in a little bit of a tough spot. Um, I think John mentioned in terms of what you know could happen next. There's I, no doubt, I think, a natural pressure on other agencies, not just the FTC, uh, to, to respond to the presence of asymmetric regulation. Maybe that response uh, is to ratchet things up. Um, at the FTC, I think, my own view is ratcheting up would require abandoning some principles that have served the agency well over time in the development of its privacy program. Uh, but I think it, it puts other agencies, uh, including the FTC, in a, in a relatively tough position. I think this matters because even within the FTC, I think I dissented on three or four privacy-related uh, matters where I thought um, maybe we were getting out ahead of the economics a little bit uh, and would say as much. Well, those are tough cases. Sometimes the economics aren't in, and the agency feels like it's got to do something. And my instinct is, well, let's get the data and then do something. It's not always shared by anybody, and you, you, by everyone, and you win some uh, and you lose some. But I think the key point is the FTC's approach means answering those unanswered questions is important. We've got economists and lawyers and a policy show. We've got people working on those problems. We've got 6B authority to go pull data and do, do research. We've got investments made by the agency uh, in answering those questions so that it can regulate smarter uh, tomorrow. I think the rate of return on those investments just went down and, and went down significantly. Um, and I worry about that uh, in, in particular uh, because I think those investments are, are worth making. I hope I'm wrong about that. And I know, and I, I will say, um, the uh, Chairwoman Ramirez has been uh, fantastic about uh, not only caring deeply about the integration of economics and the consumer protection mission, and I trust it's easy, the court's required, if you're not doing it, it's malpractice. Uh, consumer protection, it's a little bit harder, and sometimes you've got to push a culture uh, fight inside the agency. And Chairwoman Ramirez has been fantastic about that, not just in what she said publicly, but what she's done. The, the current Bureau of Economics Director at the FTC, for the first time I can remember, is a consumer protection economist, not an antitrust economist. She's also a UCLA Bruin. Go Bruins. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so I, I'm hoping that the FTC will land on the right side of this, but I think uh, that sort of interagency competition and, uh, and interplay here is, uh, there's a potential for an unhealthy dynamic, and I think it's sort of worth throwing that out there for the purposes of, of uh, discussion less than its immediate reaction to the NPR itself. Um, I, will, I will stop there. Uh, Lisa can obviously talk anytime she wants to, but I was going to interject something. Do you want to talk now? Yeah, well, so I, have, so I, I really appreciate John and Josh's thoughtful comments. They're, I think, uh, sort of, they help move the discussion forward in ways that are very positive. I, I would take issue a little bit with a couple of things they said. So. Uh, John suggested that the item precludes the use of information for certain purposes. It doesn't do that. So, well, I don't speak for the chairman. I will channel I, I the chairman here. I without opt-in, at least I uh, Okay, Maybe so, I right, so the, the item is set up so that the consumers have the choice. So I, I realize, and, you know, and Josh's governing principle, you know, there, there, are, that opt in, there are barriers to opt-in uh, from the company's perspective. But, um, but it is always the customer's choice. It's not a preclusion. And to the issue of pay for privacy or, or incentives, the, the item does not propose to ban uh, incentives. It seeks comment on it because of, in large part because of the complex issues there. And I really hope that we can get people to engage on that issue uh, because I think, I think you do a nice job uh, sort of previewing all of the challenging issues there. Uh, most of which are uh, sound and economic issues and choice issues. Um, and there's been some research around it, uh, but it is, uh, as you said, a very complicated issue. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I look forward, I mean, based on what I've heard here today, I must say I look forward to the written comments as well as the ex parte's that I know are to come. Well, let me, let me try to, uh, first of all, maybe, maybe put somebody else on the defensive besides Lisa. I, I actually should apologize. I did try, I did try to, make, to make this uh, panel more balanced, uh, but I should have tried harder, so. <laughs> 
Um, the on, only woman on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> the um, only your own. Just let's start, let me ask one or two kind of higher level um, questions. I mean. I think I think one can uh, you know, describe that the FCC's approach in this, and uh, you know the reason it is supported by a lot of people, privacy advocates, and a lot of people, is because they think that the FTC's approach is um, is just not adequate to protect privacy, and um, and and they've been in, and there's a lot of people who've been in favor of a much more prescriptive approach, privacy legislation, consumer bill of rights, whatever you want to call it, for quite a while. And it seems to me what the FCC has done, and this, you can talk about all the details, is is to adopt that sort of an approach. Um, why isn't that a good thing? Well, uh, I'll start out just as a privacy lawyer. Uh, the FCC, even without this proposed rule, uh, has exercised its authority to impose fines very, very aggressively in the data space. Um, a complaint about the FCC, and I think the only one that has any, um, you know, is, is any really significant difference between the two agencies, is that in absent specific statutory authority, its first remedy um, for first violation is to obtain a consent decree, which is burdensome and expensive and forces in almost all circumstances compliance because they're regular audits to make sure the company's in compliance. But there aren't big dollar fines in the first instance. And the FCC, by contrast, because of its interest in this area through the Enforcement Bureau, has really put a lot of heat on uh, both cable operators and phone companies with regard to their practices. So I think that largely answers the, the question about enforcement, te uh, the enforcement teeth. With regard to how prescriptive this rule is, generally information security and cybersecurity uh, under the overall, I think, quite very wise Obama administration approach to security is not, is not to be prescriptive, but to have um, evolve, room for evolving standards and evolving ways to address a constantly changing uh, threat landscape. And there, I don't think there's a particular benefit of going beyond the general FTC principles, uh, which, which really are the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act safeguards rules. There are a few very prescriptive elements, including uh, logging for all for uh, in storing logs for one year of all access to this huge range of information that are not found in the FTC um, uh, uh, best practices approach. But again, I think flexibility is probably better on the security side. Uh, with regard to opt-in, opt-out, the F FTC approach in the staff report I think is really a good one and, and could be um, replicated by the F. Uh, CC in this proceeding, and it's that sensitive data, as John was explaining, deserve um, greater and probably opt-in consent requirements with regard to um, uh, disclosures to third parties or use in a way that that uh, uh, would be surprising to consumers. Uh, but generally, the the rule is opt out with regard to other sorts of uses, and first party relationships typically don't require opt-out. I think one could easily see the FCC forbearing, if it wanted to, from imposing the same uh, kind of rigid CP&I framework um, in this area and replicating an approach that would strongly protect consumers and be enforceable with a very, very big stick. So I think uh, that that regime would be followed and would need to be followed by by the regulated companies. So. Uh I'm going to answer the question that Jim put on the table in some ways, which is a little deviation mm -hmm. from yours, Tom, which, you know, agencies have different tools and they have different statutory authority. So previous FTCs have uh, gone to Congress and sought authority for civil penalties. They sought civil penalty authority. So uh, this is primarily an FCC audience, but not exclusively. Those of you who uh, are not, don't know as much about the FTC, the, the reason that the FC, FTC <laughs> Uh, gets consents but not 
uh, civil penalties if they don't have the authority to get those civil penalties. Mm -hmm. And it's not for asking, not for lack of asking Congress to <laughs> give them that authority over various commissions. The, the lineup has changed, so I can't say exactly where this current most recent FTC is, but uh, they have certainly asked for that authority. Um, the same for data breach notification authority. Uh, so agencies, agencies can only work with the tools that they have, uh, which is another point which we haven't really discussed, which is Section 222 of the Communications Act requires providers to protect the confidentiality of information, of customer information, and requires approval uh, for use of CP&I. And so the FCC, while it looks very much to the FTC, and while I, I don't agree with your analogy, Josh, I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed listening to it. It was fun, it. Way. it was quite clever. Uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, you know, and as a, as, a, as a loyal alumni of the FTC, I, <laughs> you know, would never want to eat their lunch. Um, or take their lunch money. The, um, uh, th the fact of the matter is, is that there is this statutory obligation that exists in the enforcement context now, even without rules, and part of the commission's uh, decision in moving forward with the rulemaking was to provide certainty to both uh, providers and to uh, customers about uh, what the requirements are to comply with Section 222. And, and John raises good points about the importance of understanding and providing clarity, not creating more confusion, um, but that is one of the goals. On the issue of sensitive information, it's a really good question, right? Should, should the rules be more focused on certain types of information? Should the proposed rules be focused on certain types? There is, there is a section of the NPRM seeking comment on that as an alternative. The challenge, I think, for all of you as potential commenters and, and as stakeholders is, what is sensitive information within the context of the ISP customer relationship? So the FTC report identifies a number of areas of sensitive information, location information, kids information, health information, financial information, the last one that I always forget. Um, but is there other information that customers of ISPs would consider sensitive? So web browsing history, what part of that history is sensitive and what is not? And then there's an operational question and which we quite frankly had at the staff level. If, we, if the item proposes to provide heightened protection for sensitive information, even if we can divine what should fall within that, how difficult will it be for the ISPs to operationalize that? And so I invite the ISPs to speak to that question as part of the rulemaking. I mean, I'm a big believer in rulemakings as a way of getting information and data on the table, um, information and data and other information on the table. Um, and so I look forward to grappling with all of that. So, so Tom's original question was, well, why don't we just ratchet up um, the level of regulation economy-wide? Um, and I mean, the reason is that to do so would raise costs uh, uh, for consumers. And that there, you, you, there is an important cost-benefit analysis to be conducted here. Suppose that Google had to uh, obtain opt-in consent every time you searched for information about a hospital. Um, or suppose that um, the Android operating system had to keep reminding you that it's tracking your location data and that ultimately that information will find its way into the hands of data brokers. The result of, of those things is that consumers would end up paying subscription fees to Google um, or they would um, pay more for cell phone service. And the, the question ultimately is how, how do we if, assuming that there is some consumer benefit to be gained by uh, forcing consumers to think even more than they already do about each individual data transaction that they conduct, um, what is the associated host, cost of that? And uh, that's, that's a hard question, but it is a question that should be answered ecosystem-wide. It's not a question that's really amenable to sector-specific incremental regulation of the type that the FCC proposes here. So let me, um, uh, related to all of that, I'm, I, I, speaking as a non-lawyer, I'm told, I, 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 I gather that the FCC could have essentially adopted, uh, you know, after the, after the FTC's jurisdiction was, was taken away, could have, adopted, could have said, we're gonna follow the FTC's approach. We're gonna enforce this, we're gonna enforce, uh, uh, police, police this sector using the FTC's approach. So the, the first question that would come to me before you even get the formal cost benefit analysis is, uh, 
has there been any analysis suggesting that when that approach, when the FTC did have jurisdiction following its approach, that 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 there were problems? What were the problems with privacy privacy related problems? I guess that this is. Well, I, I think FTC FTC staff would tell you it's a target rich environment, so there is no shortage of data security and data privacy cases that the FTC has brought. But, I, but I'm not quite sure I'm following even the question. Well, the question is the baseline is the FTC approach, right? That would, uh, and so the question is. I mean, there are two different questions. One is what, what are the substantive standards the FTC applies, which are quite different from the standards the NPRM proposes to apply here. And the other question is what are the different procedural regimes as between the FTC and the FCC? And, and Lisa's right that the FCC has civil penalty authority, whereas except in consent cases where you bring a contempt action, the <coughs> FTC doesn't have that. Theoretically, it can obtain some monetary equitable relief, but that's, that tends not to be a very significant component of the. Yeah, my question is a little different. My question is, what were the problems? What were the consumer harms under the previous, under the FTC approach? When the FTC was enforcing its approach, what were, the, what were the harms? What? There weren't a lot of cases. Bro. I mean, there, there were some, so, but I mean, ISPs were not disproportionately represented. In well, that's, the my point. that's my and, point. And the reason is that <laughs> ISPs tend to have, first of all, ISPs have contractual relationships with all of their subscribers, which forces them to um, address the question of privacy head on, uh, whereas subscribers often don't have contractual relationships with all the edge providers that are collecting information about them. And on top of that, I mean, ISPs generally have, you know, fairly robust best standards, practi best practices, attitudes towards data collection, whereas that's not true of all the, um, of, of a number of the edge providers that consumers don't even see when they traverse through the internet. In, in particular, if you have a subscriber who is paying you significant monthly subscription fees, acting creepily with regard to subscriber data is a significant risk. By contrast, if you have no relationship with um, a data broker, for example, who's selling information about you, they other than than legal restrictions, there isn't a market um, uh, pressure on them to act in a restrained way, except with regard to their customers who may not want to be associated with them. But there's a very direct relationship that John describes, which I think has led to at least the ISPs that I've counseled, and I've counseled several of them on privacy, to be um, c relatively cautious compared to other business models that I've seen that may collect the same sort of information. Well, I, I could, I have lots more questions, but I... John, can I jump in for yeah, a yeah. second on that? Because I, where the original question started, I thought was, has there been any systematic study or evidence that the FTC was is under or over enforcing in this space? Um, so that one's easy. I think the answer to that question is no. I mean, one can point to different substantive and procedural authorities and say, you know, this is different, that is different. But evidence that there is under enforcement, I think the answer is no. But I think that raises an important question. I mean, I think where you were going is an interesting place, which is um, the sort of obvious thing to do would be to take the unfairness and deception authorities and replicate them, okay? And and and, uh, and the FCC didn't, and so 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 why? And I think there are lots of good legal reasons for that. Uh, however, I think one of the criticisms that did get directed the FTC's way um, by various privacy groups and the like is, uh, well you've got these constraints that you are restricted to dealing with economic harm, right? So you say in the deception authority um, has to be uh, harm detriment to consumers and unfairness, you've got to do a cost benefit analysis. And I think inside the FTC, we view that as a feature. And I think in some corners of the world, it is viewed as a bug. But if one thinks that that perception sort of motivates the demand for more expansive regulations sort of outside of um, harm to consumers in the sort of classic economic sense, uh, I think it also tells you, you know, what is in it for another privacy regulator to reject the FTC's approach. It's, if it's, I think that is what makes, sort of as an FTC person, that is what makes me concerned. 
reading the NPRM is because if the rationale is uh, the restrictions on attacking only uh, deception or uh, you know business practices where there's consumer harm uh, is seen as too restrictive, um, well, I, you know, without those limits, uh, I worry about what types of practices would be up for grabs, including in particular. Um, so, for example, you know, we, we talked about one example where I think it's pretty clear on average consumers are better off. Um, that, I think, is really at a 30,000-foot level uh, conceptual difference is whether restraints, uh, whether the economic re reproach and the constraints that it, it imposes on an agency are a bug or a feature. And I think that, that is really at issue. By, by the way, Tom, you, you asked, I think, uh, in passing, whether the FCC has the legal authority to replicate the right. FTC's yeah. regime. With respect to the substantive standards, I believe the answer is yes, um, if uh, the Title II reclassification is upheld. Um, happy to get into yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> no, the answer, sorry, my, my, my actually, it, you, you can I'm do sorry, it through I a combination, combination of um, forbearance <laughs> and reliance on so, and the, it, that is one of the recommendations, I th think it's fair to say, of the industry proposal, and it's something the commission saw it put, you know, put out for comment. So let me uh, go to the audience for um, questions, if any. Alan? Yeah, yeah. Could you, Anna, could you identify yourself? Yeah. And Alan Rawl, uh, Sidley Austin, and uh, former OMB staffer. So all this talk of uh, cost-benefit analysis really warms the uh, the heart. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so recently, the in the uh, the DC the district court in DC in the MetLife decision uh, struck down the Financial Stability Oversight Council designation of MetLife as a SIFI systematic, uh, whatever the acronym stands for, financially significant systematically, uh, and did so in large part because of the failure, the ref not failure, but, but in fact refusal uh, and thus failure of the Financial Stability Oversight Council to consider costs uh, of, uh, of its uh, designation of MetLife as a SIFI. Um, and so really the question is, how is the FCC going to react to this and all this discussion of cost-benefit analysis, of course, which Federal Trade Commission, as was referenced earlier, under uh, you know uh, the unfairness authority is statutorily obligated to do, and the the district court um, uh, indicated in the MetLife decision that whether or not there is a, a statutory requirement to do cost-benefit analysis, it's a requirement in order not to have an arbitrary and capricious rule. So my question is. Um, Th there really isn't any consideration of the costs imposed either on the ISPs who would be regulated, the consumers that would be impacted by uh, the, the lack of uh, innovation and choice that the, the rule might uh, uh, entail. Uh, and there's no real uh, characterization of what the harms that would be prevented by the rule. So does the FCC have a framework for doing a cost-benefit analysis? Uh, there are questions that are asked in the small uh, entity impact analysis, but really there's nothing provided by the FCC itself with regard to the, the harms and the risks that are being abated, the costs on the regulated entities and consumers who would have derivative costs. Thank you. So I thought it was scary enough when uh, John mentioned PRA <laughs> for data breach. Uh, I'm going to take your question as an assignment to go back and look at that MetLife case, which I haven't yet had the opportunity to do, although I found the NPRM, article, uh, NPRM piece on it very interesting. Um, so I will take that as assignment and uh, and happy to get back to you on it. You just helped, Alan. That's good. <laughs> Other questions? Well, I'm going to I'm going to ask another question. That uh, when you go through the um, the NPRM, there's a lot of reference to a lot of things, and particularly the, uh, the 2012 reports. But there's, I, I'm not sure there's any reference, I didn't, this may not be quite correct, to the 2014 White House reports, which actually take a different approach because the, the uh, you know, the proposed rule, you know, rests heavily on the, on the FIPS approach. And the, in 2014 reports, one from the White House itself and one from the PCAST, suggest that in a world of big data, uh, FIPS may be uh, 
outmoded and um, and that one should and that policy should not focus you know ex ante ex ex ante on, on limiting the amount of information used and and how it can be used but rather focus on concrete harms did that uh, did a reading of those reports uh, have much influence or well, it's an interesting issue, but again, if you look at Section 222 of the Communications Act, it imposes obligations on providers to protect the confidentiality of information and, uh, at least in some instances, to seek approval. And so, uh, <laughs> I feel, to, to Josh's point, I feel like the NPRM cites the FTC a lot. We do cite the, the White House. I can't ever remember if it ended up as a white paper, a green paper, a blue paper, right. the color kept yeah. changing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, it does, there does seem to be broad agreement among our stakeholders that notice, consent, security are the ways we should look at uh, privacy within, with respect to 222, and I'm not sure that there's sort of clear alternatives to that, um, but it's an interesting question. I think that one could do all of those things within the FTC framework with a few adjustments for greater sensitivity of certain types of, of material that ISPs have, namely contents of communications which have already been um, subject to at least some regulation under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act deep packet inspection, um, and then advertising using sensitive data, which the self-regulatory DAA guidelines and the FCC report both acknowledge um, is something that, that would require additional steps. One could perhaps address location data in that as well, but really pinpoint the areas that of great of sensitivity, areas where information might be prejudicial if it wound up in the wrong hands. Um, and areas that are, are actually unique to the ISP um, subscriber relationship. Um, and I, I was frankly kind of discouraged that the NPRM didn't more seriously take this up and, and really propose to think it through, but instead approach this as, okay, we, we have a categorical CP&I um, regulatory approach that disregards sensitivity of information, and we're now going to play this out to its logical conclusion. And I, I really do hope that in the, the proceeding, the FCC is open to um, a, an approach that would be more pinpointed and really focus on, on areas of potential harm. Well, let me thank the panel, and particularly Lisa. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs>